Welcome to uh, the continuation of our series on the book of Nehemiah. And we are using this book, not using it, we're interpreting it, but it's basically a leadership biography. I mean, it's more than that, but it's not less than that. And so we're kind of looking at some leadership lessons through Nehemiah. And I think things start to get exciting at this point. So let me say a prayer for us and we'll dive right in. Lord, thank you for the mercies that you've given to us. We're grateful for your hand that's been over us, and I lift up to you all the concerns and cares and prayers for comfort, for those who are anxious, for those who need healing, all those in our number and all those within the sound of my voice. Lord, we lift up our care and concern to you, and we also lift up our praise to you that you are a good God, that you see down this road, and that you are powerful enough to work in all things for good, even though it does not always seem that way to us, but we know that all of history and all of, all of human purpose bends to your will, and we thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen. Well, here's our number for questions. It's also on the handout, whether you're, the handout's online, it's also in, on paper here, but there's the question line. If you wanna text in your questions during class, we'll answer as many as we can. So we are studying a man named Nehemiah, he's one of the great leaders in all the history of Israel. And this book is about a turning point in the life of Israel. So big picture, you have Abraham in 2000 BC, you have the Israelites become a nation, and by the time of King David in 1000 BC, they are at the God has fulfilled his promises. They are, really are a great nation. They really are in this land. And they really are intended to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Well, after David and Solomon in the 10th century BC, they begin to lose their faithfulness. They begin to deviate from following God. They have a little civil war and split the kingdom in the north, which we're gonna call Samaria because of the maps we're gonna look at uh, at this period. At this period, the north was called Samaria and the south was called Judea. And so even though they were kinsmen, they were warring with each other and they had split from each other. And so as time goes on, the northern kingdom is uh, overrun and deported by the Assyrians in 722 BC. So as time moves on, and then finally, the southern kingdom of Judah is overrun and the people are sent into exile by the Babylonian Empire in 586 BC. And so the Jews literally are scattered throughout modern day Iraq and Iran and, and that, that general area of the world. And so God has prophesied that if the people will turn back to him, he will bring them back together and bring them back to the land. Well, the people do indeed begin to entreat God and turn back to God. And read about this in the book of Daniel. So a lot of your Old Testament covers this period. Well, the Persian Empire conquers the Babylonians in 539 BC. And Cyrus, the king of the Persians, not that he's a believer in God, but their philosophy is, hey, if you people wanna go back and live in your native land, you're welcome to go back. As long as you pay your taxes, don't cause trouble, I don't care. If you do, I'll kill you. But otherwise, we're good, you know? And so, the Jews start in small groups going back over from 538 BC, over about the next 100 years, they begin going back to Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem's totally destroyed. The Babylonians tore down the temple. I mean, they didn't just burn it, they literally deconstructed it. They pushed the walls down from the inside so that, I mean, Jerusalem isn't even an inhabitable city. And of course, all the neighboring people came in and took their farmland and took whatever homes were left. And they literally, by all accounts historically, the Jews should have disappeared from the pages of history. But God calls them back as he promised that he would. And so in 445 BC, that's our time period, in 445 BC, a man named Nehemiah comes back and, is, and begins to uh, and take on a project 
to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem and to help begin to rebuild the people. And as our story opened, we began to look at how he did this. He was in a very high position in the Persian Empire, but not one of great authority. I mean, he was under the rule of the king, and if you read chapter one, you realize how much he prayed to God and how afraid he was to even ask the king to let him go do this. And so we began to look at what did he do? And so the first thing, first step is he prayed. He committed his endeavors to God. He prayed to God and confessed that, listen, what's happened to us is our own fault. We weren't faithful to you, but you promised that if we turned back to you, you would bring us back. So God, please open the doors, make it possible for us to go back. And so he committed this endeavor to God. He knew that if it was gonna happen, God would have to be in it. And we talked about in our lives to commit our endeavors to God. Commit your family to God, commit your business to God. In other words, you, you, you really don't have to be in control of these things. You really can say, God, why don't you own this and I'm gonna serve you? Well, the second thing he did was he prepared. So he prayed to God and he went to ask the king and. Sure enough, the king said, yes, I'll send you. Well, he had already prepared. He asked for letters to the keeper of the king's forest and for an escort to get there. And he said, give me uh, a safe passage to the governors of the various territories I'll be passing through. So he'd done his homework and he had prepared. And that's because he expected God to move. Now, some people say that you should pray and somehow your prayers have a claim on God, like God should do whatever you want. That's not really what I'm saying. I'm simply saying, ask God and expect that he will move. If he says no, there's a good reason for him to say no. But what you don't wanna have happen is God said, yes, I'm in that. And you go, oh, well, I didn't really think you were gonna do it. So I actually haven't prepared or anything. You know, that's awkward. Right, so basically go into things with the attitude that God will wants to move. So that's what we have so far. And so the king said yes. And so Nehemiah leaves his position and he takes the letters from the king and he takes um, some soldiers the king is sending with him. He's apparently held in high regard because he's, he's good at what he does. And so he begins to go to Jerusalem. So I wanna show you where, where he's going. So he is in probably in Susa. And so this is the Arabian desert. No one goes, takes a direct route. Uh, there were no direct flights at that time. So he has to go all the way up and, and around. This is about 1,100 miles. And so I wanna tell you about how long this journey took. And this is a quote from Ezra. This Ezra is a priest and he has also returned to Jerusalem a little bit before Nehemiah. And in, in that account, you read that on the first day of the first month, Ezra began, he left Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. And so that journey took Ezra the priest four months to get there. So I also, I wanna give you a sense of the pacing here. Do you remember between the time that Nehemiah prayed and then waited for an opportunity, prayed to God to give him favor with the king, it was five months before he had the opportunity to ask the king. Well, now he asked the king, the king said, you can go, he gets his things together, and it's probably a little faster for him since he had a military escort, but this is a several month trip. So nothing in this story, even though you and I are reading it really quickly, I mean, we're just in chapter two, so we, it only took us a few seconds to read it, there's a lot of time happening here. And the reason I want you to realize that is because that's the way it is in your life. In our lives, the challenges that we face don't resolve themselves in a matter of seconds or in a matter of days. And so it's not like you could read Nehemiah chapter one and two and go, wow, that was nice. Uh, it took me two minutes and his story had a, had a happy ending. Well, of course it doesn't work that way, does it? And it didn't work that way for him. There are all this time in between that gets filled up with constant prayer. And the same is true for us. 
is as we go through this, we need to be constant in prayer and never waver. And that's the way Nehemiah was. His purpose never wavered. His prayers never stopped. You're gonna see in this book, Nehemiah is praying constantly throughout this book. So he leaves for Jerusalem and takes this journey. And we go from chapter two, verse eight, where the king said, yes, you can go, to chapter two, verse nine, when he arrives. And so between those two verses is several months of time. He said, then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river. So if you're in the, in the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers, you basically have, that's the center of the world where the uh, Persian kingdom was headquartered. And anything that went down towards Syria and Lebanon and Israel and Egypt as you would go south, those were beyond the river. And so as he went through there, he, he went through territory that the Persian king had set up a governor of Syria and a governor of Lebanon and a governor of the northern part of Israel. And so he had safe passage and orders from the king that, so that they would aid him on his journey. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and I was there for three days. So let me give you an idea of, of what we're talking about. I want you to remember, we're gonna talk next time about uh, the people surrounding this and what effect their resistance had on this endeavor. But you will hear this name a lot. So Sanballat is, by the way, known from history, not just from this book. Sanballat was the governor of Samaria. So he had been appointed by the king to rule this northern part of what's today Israel. As a matter of fact, today in Israel, the West Bank, this, this is the West Bank, by the way. I think I've showed you this before, but basically, this is not entirely accurate, but what, this is all West Bank over here today. So the West Bank today, Jews call it Judea and Samaria. And this is why they call it Judea and Samaria. That's the ancient name of the West Bank today where Palestinians are. But Sanballat was not an Israelite and he was the governor of Samaria. So he's riding high in this area. He's, he's exercising a lot of authority and needless to say, he wasn't very happy that someone had come from the king to help restore the fortunes of the Jews. And so at this time, he comes to Jerusalem, which is in ruins and he stays there for three days. Now there are rulers of all these other kingdoms. I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead and I'm gonna tell you about another name you're gonna hear next week. And that is Geshem the Arab. And he ruled the kingdom on the other side of the Dead Sea, which is Arabia. And he also is known from inscriptions. And I'll show you some of the inscriptions next, next week. So if you could learn Aramaic by then, it would be very helpful. <laughs> but he is also known from inscriptions at the time. So these two characters, again, you know, I have a passion for you to understand that these are not fairy tales. These are real people in real history. These people are known outside the Bible from this era of history as well. So he goes to Jerusalem and he's there for three days. So what does he do? So from when we think about leadership lessons, he's prayed to God, he's committed this endeavor to God, he has prepared that if God is, wants to move, he will be prepared to move. And so when he gets to Jerusalem, he says this, I arose in the night and I had just a few men with me and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. So he shows up, but they don't know why he's there. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. So he's riding on a donkey or horse. I went out by night by the valley gate, and I'll show you where all this is in just a second, to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and the gates had been burned up by fire. The gates were made of wood, 
the walls were made of stone. Then I went on to the fountain gate into the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that, to pass. The debris was too thick. Then I went up in the night by the valley and I inspected the wall and I turned back and I entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews or the priests or the nobles, the officials or any of the rest who were going to do the work. So what does he do first? If you think about it, this is what any good leader does in a new assignment. I don't know if you've ever had a new assignment, but you're really wise if, if you're a new leader that first you watch and you listen. Probably the greatest recipe for disaster for a leader is to come in and just start telling everybody what they should be doing, is listen and watch. And that's what he does. He spends three days listening, getting the lay of the land. He goes out at night and goes and looks and surveys the situation. He tries to get a feel for the task at hand before he begins. And that's just a wise leadership lesson, is survey uh, the, the uh, landscape before you begin to act. You know, I've known so many leaders whose motto was, you know, shoot first, then aim. And you do a lot of damage with that. I've worked for a lot of people like that. And you, it's, it's not a good thing, right? It's like the old carpenter's maximum. And I've quoted this so many times. And that is, you measure twice and you cut once. In other words, make sure you understand the situation before you act. Well, that's what Nehemiah is doing. He's going to survey this area. So I want to show you what we're dealing with. Okay, the map on the left is a map of what Jerusalem looked like. I mean, it's a, just a map of the walls. Now, all these walls are destroyed, and so there's just rubble. Well, they didn't cart the stones away. They just pushed them all down. And these are not, these are not like your retaining wall at home. Okay, the narrowest of these walls is about eight feet. So a lot of stones. I'm gonna show you a picture in a little bit of a, there actually are pieces of Nehemiah's wall, a little bit of it still there today. I'll show you that in a little bit. But pieces of this wall, particularly this wall that goes around this area, are as much as seven meters thick. So think what, that 23 feet, 23 or 24 feet thick. So they demolished this and they worked hard to demolish it and it's not gonna be easy to rebuild it. So I wanna orient you here because so much of this lesson talks about the wall itself. So here's the terrain. So the Temple Mount is actually on a high place. It's on, it's on a mountain. And on the side here is the Kidron Valley runs all the way up the eastern side of Jerusalem. The Hinnom Valley runs all the way across the southern side. And then this is called the Central Valley, it's Teropian Valley today. So this is high ground and all of this is high ground. And there's a valley there in between. And so all that area in green is where they had inhabited Jerusalem when the Babylonians attacked and, and destroyed the wall. Okay, so this is uh, Jerusalem. And so all of these walls that you see, the gates, you could kind of see on there. And some of these are questionable because it's not known exactly where all this is because these walls have been rebuilt over, over history. So the one place I wanted to show though is this temple on this mountain used to have Solomon's temple. The Babylonians destroyed it. Then when Ezra comes back, after the Persians let him come back, they build a little temple and I showed you a picture of it. It's not really big, but they build it back in the same place. So I wanna show you what this looks like today to orient you. So if you're standing here, this is us. We are standing on the Mount of Olives. So there's a valley right here. This is, uh, you call it Zion, the Temple Mount. I mean, it's a, it's a hill that Jerusalem is built on. And over here, this is the Mount of Olives. And Jesus, by the way, used to go down this valley and up into the Temple Mount. And so we're standing here and we're looking at the Temple Mount. This is what that looks like today. So the picture on the right is today, if you're standing, so this is us, right? Here we are. And we are looking across at the Temple Mount. Now, 
on the Temple Mount, this wall is not the wall of Nehemiah. It's a wall that Herod built 400 years later, and it's still there. And this is where the temple was, but today there's a mosque there called the Dome of the Rock. But that's exactly where the temple was. And so what I wanted you to see is if you're standing over here on the east looking across, it wouldn't have been this magnificent, the wall wasn't quite that tall, but I wanted you to get the idea of how deep this Kidron Valley is, for one thing. And so when Nehemiah is riding around checking the walls, he's riding here. He's riding along the walls. And so we're looking at this piece right here. And again, that's the wall of Herod, not the wall of Nehemiah, but you get the idea. Is that helpful to where you're looking at it? And this is today, obviously you got all these buildings and everything today, but this hill right here, this has always had the temple on it. That's, that is where the Jerusalem was. And down the hill here, if you go from the Temple Mount, you go downhill a little bit, you get to the old city of David. That's the original Jerusalem in 1000 BC when David conquered Jerusalem and built the city. And then Solomon, of course, his son, built that temple up on the hill, but David built the city right here. So a little geography to give you an idea that this is not a huge thing, but if you just look at that picture, you realize, okay, this is not a trivial task. This is a really thick wall and it's really long. I mean, this is not a small task that they're about to undertake. So what does Nehemiah do next? After he surveyed the territory, he said, then I said to them, he's speaking to the Jews, to the chief priests and the people that are there. And again, they're not very well organized in that they're just living where they can. They're mingled in with other people that have taken their ancestral land. And he said, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer derision. So for the Jews to ever rebuild their nation, to continue to enjoy the promises of God, first thing you need is, is a fortified city. You need to be able to keep people from coming in and burning your temple down again or killing your people. And so he said, let us build the wall of Jerusalem. Today we would call this vision casting. In other words, what he said was, look, nobody likes what's going on. Uh, we don't see a better life for your kids. You're wondering what are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're gonna build the wall back around this city and we're gonna restore our city and we're gonna restore our nation. Well, why should they believe him? Look at what he does. I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also the words the king had spoken to me. What did he do? He told his story. He said, God is in this. This isn't just Nehemiah's idea. They're not gonna follow Nehemiah because this is not going to be easy, but he's going, he told them his testimony, if you will. He said, I prayed to God. God answered my prayers. I'm here because God gave me favor with the king. I used my position to where I could even talk to the king. I risked my life to ask him and he said yes. And here I have uh, letters to the keeper of the king's forest that we can get supplies. And so God is in this. And so he casts the vision, but more than just casting a vision, he says, this is something that God is in. And so they said, then let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. And what does that mean? It means that they committed themselves to join in what they believed God was doing here and what God wanted to do. And I just want to point out something else that good leaders do is they begin to encourage the people. They don't just show up and say, I'd like to build a monument or I'd like to do this. And you're like, well, that's really great, but... Why? What's the purpose? What's the point? Well, when we share the story of what God's doing in our lives, now I've moved on and I'm talking about you as a leader in terms of an ambassador with the gospel. Whenever you share the story of what God has done or is doing in your life, that is hugely encouraging to people. Don't underestimate how desperate most people are for some kind of vision some kind of meaning and purpose and encouragement in life. Uh, 
And so this is what Nehemiah does. He said, look, I'm gonna tell you what God is doing more than I'm gonna tell you what Nehemiah is doing. And so they said, yes, let's do it. And so here's a, a little different map. I wanna show you this one because it's the same map we looked at before, but it's a little more granular. So here's the Valley of Hinnom. Here is the Kidron Valley. Here's a little Teropian Valley. And then you can see in this one better the gates and the walls. By the way, I don't, you probably have noticed the Dung Gate. That is not where I would want to live in Jerusalem. I mean, it's bad enough. I've lived in towns that I was mildly embarrassed to put on my return address. You know, I live in, you know, Goat Springs, you know, whatever or something. How would you like to write Dung Gate? You know, that's your address, right? So why do they call it the Dung Gate? Like the stupidest name ever. Well, probably, probably because the Hinnom Valley, uh, and many of you probably know this because of uh, Bible lessons about this word, the Hinnom Valley, that was the city dump. So in those days, they didn't exactly have water treatment plants, didn't exactly have sewer systems, Basically what you did was you had in the middle of the street was your sewer and guess where it ran? Downhill, right? And so this is downhill. The highest point here, by the way, is the temple and it kind of goes downhill to the city of David. You're still on a hill, but it's going downhill. It goes downhill and empties into the Valley of Hinnom. That's where the sewage went. That's where the uh, dump was. That's probably why this is called the Dung Gate. Now this uh, Valley of Hinnom, needless to say, not a pleasant place. Uh, and that's where you get the word Gehenna from. Uh, you probably have heard that before, but in the New Testament, the Hebrew word Gehenna is often translated hell. In fact, it is one of the two Hebrew words that in your Old Testament, when you read the word hell, it probably means Gehenna. And what does Gehenna mean? The Valley of Hinnom. Well, why would you consider that hell? Because it's the dump. Okay, it's the dump and it's the waste treatment center all together. All right, so I know it's after dinner, so that's all we're going to talk about that. But anyway, that's why they called it the Dung Gate, and that's what the Hinnom Valley was. And this is downhill. And so once again, our picture over here to the right is us standing on the Mount of Olives, looking over the Kidron Valley, and we're looking at where the temple would be. And so you can see how deep this valley is. It's very terraced because of agriculture, but you can see how deep this, this valley is on the east side. And so what uh, he does is he comes out, if you remember where he's been, he came out of, uh, they don't have it on here, but I'll show you where it was. He came out of the valley gate right here and he rode around here, he passed down by the Dung Gate, and he came back up to the, uh, to the Water Gate, and this is where he couldn't pass, and so he went down into the valley, and he rode along the valley looking up at the walls. And then when he got to the north part, he couldn't get by, and so he turned around and came back, and that was his reconnoitering. And so he is now, uh, got the people mobilized, and so they begin to rebuild. And this is what chapter three is about. And I wanna look at just a few pieces because I want you to see how he went about marshalling the people for this endeavor. It's really pretty clever. So in chapter three, verse one, uh, Eliashiv, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. So they started right here at the sheep gate. They consecrated it, this is with wood, set its doors, and they consecrated it as far as the Tower of 100, which is on this map called the Tower of Hananiel. And so they built the wall in this piece. And next to him, the men of Jericho built and so the men of Jericho are building this portion of the wall. And next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri, he and his family were building this section of the wall. The sons of Hathanah built the fish gate right there. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. So I want to pause for a second because as you read this, 
it's just one whole chapter of telling you all these people you don't know and what part of the wall they built. And I wanted you to see this. There's some really good leadership lessons in this. Number one, he's divided the work up. So he, is, he surveyed the territory and he realized we need a plan. And so he divided up the sections of wall and everybody had their own section of wall so they could take some pride in the work that they were doing. They could work with their kin or their families or their coworkers. The high priest is there working with the other priests. You'll see families, big extended families, working together on pieces of the wall. Really great way to organize this is everybody was working with people that they knew. Second thing, you notice that chapter three is gonna mention a lot of people, but the high priest was probably the highest, certainly the highest religious authority of the time. And he starts, and this is no accident, that the high priest himself was building the wall. The high priest, the, the one who you would think would be exempt from the work, he and his fellow priests were building the wall along with the people, leading by example. In other words, leaders also have to roll up their sleeves and do work. And that's what the high priest did, and that was a huge encouragement to the people. Second thing that happens here that's also very interesting is the idea that the men of Jericho built a piece of this wall. Now, if you, if you remember, Jericho is not right by Jerusalem. Jericho's actually up on the, let me see if I've got a map here and I'll just show you basically where we're talking about. Uh, no, sorry about that, wrong maps. Anyway. Jerusalem is down by the Dead Sea. Jericho is further north and east. And it's not even like a suburb. It's not like Edmund or Moore. I mean, this is like Tulsa, right? So it's like Jews from other cities came and joined the work to rebuild the wall. So Nehemiah is casting a wide net. Why? Because he's not just trying to build the walls of Jerusalem. He's also trying to rebuild the Jewish people, and he wants all all of the Jewish people to have a part in rebuilding their nation. People that have some sweat equity or have some skin in the game are bought into your vision. People that don't have any skin in the game, and many of you are leaders and you know this lesson, but Nehemiah knew this 2,400 years ago, is everybody needs to be part of the rebuilding so that everyone feels like they can share in the rewards. So people got invested in the outcome. And so you're gonna see Jews from all around this area, not just the area of Jerusalem. And so it goes on, and he said, next to them, Meramoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired, and next to them, Meshulam, so we're just moving along, just moving along this wall, and different families would be working. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Benah, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired. This is another city. Tekoa is a city that is relatively close. It's probably, let me see, Jerusalem to Bethlehem, three to five miles, and Tekoa is a bedroom community of Bethlehem. You know, so it's a couple miles outside Bethlehem. So they're six or seven miles away. This is where Amos the prophet is from, little town of Tekoa. Not a big city, but a lot of influential Jews and a lot of faithful people came from there. And so those people came from the village of Tekoa and they were building, but notice this. And next to them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. So the leaders of that city did not show up to do the work. They felt like they were a little too good to do the work, but the people of that city really did buy into it. So I don't want you to think that Nehemiah had an easy job. You begin to see when you read this, some of the political undercurrents that are happening here, because some of these Jewish people have intermarried. You're gonna find this out later. They have intermarried, and so, uh, some of these guys like Sanballat and Tobiah, the Ammonite, he's married a Jewish girl. And so there's a lot of political connections here. And so not everybody 
feels like they want to move forward with this. Some of these people are gonna wait and see kind of, well, if they're successful, I'll jump on, but if they're not, I can't afford to burn any bridges with my business partners. Seriously, I want you to think about this in very modern terms because that's what we're dealing with here. So when they started building the walls of Jerusalem, they kind of severed their civic ties to the people around them. Now, the people around them resented that and said, look, why are you Jews trying to rebuild? Uh, we really don't want you to have your nation back here again. We really don't want you to do very well. And so they began to cut their civic and business ties with the people around them. You know, you found out pretty quickly uh, who your friends were. Been reading the uh, uh, memoir, I guess you would call it, of Jared Kushner. So I read a lot of memoirs, a lot of international leaders, and I will have to say, it's not a plug for Jared Kushner. This is better than I thought it was going to be. But there's a really good lesson in here when he's talking about the Abraham Accords. And so as he began to do this, one of the pieces of advice, he knows he's a neophyte, that he doesn't know that much about it, but one of the Arab leaders says to him, and this, this could literally be the case for Nehemiah, he says, look, when you start to do this, Right now, America has a lot of friends in this region because America gives a lot of aid in this region. He said, but when you start to do this, you'll find out who your friends really are. And that's what happened in Nehemiah, is he begins to do this and he begins to restore their fortunes and in a sense, he kind of finds out who's really committed to the cause of the Jews and who's not committed to the cause of the Jews. And that's still true today. As a leader, we're gonna talk next week about how do you deal with resistance to what you're trying to do. But one of the things I want you to know is this is an age old story. Anything you're trying to lead, you don't have to be building the walls around Jerusalem. You could just be putting in a new payroll system at work. And let me assure you, you will find out who your friends are. And so Nehemiah, I want you to get a feel for the real life uh, portion of this is this wasn't easy to do. There's an awful lot of self-interest floating around. So let me pause there with that and see what questions do we have? Lots of questions about the wall. Yes. How tall was the wall? How long was a section? Well, we don't know. Uh, how tall. The wall was tall enough to keep the bad guys out. It was pretty thick. Uh, they're going to build it, by the end of tonight, they're going to build it halfway up. But it doesn't tell you how tall it was. I will show you a picture, and I'll show you a picture with a person standing there so you'll get a bit of an idea of a remaining piece of the wall. But it could have been taller than that. I mean, it's 2,400 years ago, and a lot's been built, so we don't know. The sections were probably... Uh, not necessarily prefab sections, it was like what can you handle kind of sections. You're gonna notice that the men from Tekoa do two sections. So we don't know a lot of these answers. I just wanted you to get an idea and when you see the picture in a little bit you realize, oh okay, this is not trivial. This is not like building you know, a fence around your backyard. So I wanted you to get a sense of there's a huge level of effort involved. Where did they get the beams from the forest? Yes, so in ancient times, where would you get the wood? Well, all the wood belonged to the king, but he had a letter to the Asaph, if you remember from chapter one, that's the name of the guy who was in charge of the king's forests. So he requisitioned it from the government. And Lebanon was known, was very, very wooded, but Israel was too. So, it, it, interesting story. Let me move to forward to current times. If you saw a picture of what Israel looked like in 1860s, 1870s, maybe a little bit later, Mark Twain went to Israel then and took, there were some pictures taken. And it looks like the Sahara Desert. There's not a tree anywhere over there. If you go there today, the Israelis have planted more than a million trees since statehood and they plant them every year. It is lush. I mean, lots of trees over there. Today is way more like it was then. It was during the time when uh, Arabs had control of that, there was, uh, they cut down 
most of the trees and didn't really plant anything. So if you go to Israel today, you'll notice like, wow, there are a lot of forests, a lot of trees, a lot of orchards and so forth. That's much more like it was then. So they had wood there and then they could also import it because he had letters from the king and he could go to the king's uh, keeper of the forest and say, I'd like to requisition some cedars and whatever, and they would bring them in. So this was one of the real interesting things God did is he, inna- and this is what encouraged the people. They go, how are we gonna build? He goes, I have letters here. We can get all the wood that we want. And they'd go, wow, God's hand must have been in that. It's not like the king gives anybody access to the royal forest. So th- there was a lot more wood there than, uh, than you probably have in your mind. You probably think of Israel as being kind of a desert. It's, it's not really, and it certainly wasn't in that time. So good question. So some of the nobles worked, some of them didn't, some of the people did, and some of the people were kind of hedging their bets uh, just a little bit. So uh, another one. Next to them, uh, Azil the son of Harhiah, the goldsmiths repaired, Next to him, Hananiah. You probably have never heard of Hananiah, but he's one of my favorite guys in the Bible. You know why? Because he made perfume. He was a perfumer. He repaired and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. This is the broad wall, by the way. Hezekiah built this wall in about 720 BC. Remember now it's 444 BC. He built this wall when the Assyrians had destroyed Samaria and they were coming for Jerusalem. Beautiful story in the Bible, but he built that wall. So that wall is hugely thick wall. It was built around 720 BC. And so they're repairing this section of the wall. This is the section that's probably 20 some feet thick. And they restored Jerusalem next to the broad wall. Next to them, Rephiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem repaired. So I want to stop and talk about this too. So not only do you have the priests and you have people from Jericho and you have people from the town of Tekoa coming in, but you have the guilds, you have the trade unions jumping in. And anybody that had an affinity, you would say, hey, the goldsmiths, why don't you guys take a section of the wall? Have you ever, I'm sure you have, gone around town and you'll see those little signs on the medians and it says, you know, this little stretch of highway is adopted by this business and I think they keep it clean or maybe pay for it to be mowed. I actually don't know what they do, but I love them for whatever it is because it looks really good. But that's what they were doing here. It's like the goldsmith said, we'll do part of the wall. And the perfume maker said, we'll do part of the wall. Now, I don't want to stereotype here, but you wouldn't think perfume makers would be all that good at building a wall, but they did. Everybody pitches in, right? Everybody pitches in. And this is a brilliant idea, and I'm going to talk about diversity in just a little bit, but I want you to realize how big a net he spreads. Everybody participates in this because it's not about whether you're a priest or whether you're from Tekoa or from Jerusalem or Jericho or if you're a goldsmith or if you're a carpenter, whatever it may be. It's all about the unifying idea is we are all Jews. We are God's people and we are engaged in God's business. Some of these people probably didn't like each other. For all I know, the perfumers and the goldsmiths were litigating against each other in court right now. We don't know, but there are people like us. You know that there are are difficulties here, right? And yet they come together, why? Because they find a common ground. Our God has blessed this work and we as God's people are all gonna come together. And so there's a tremendous sense of unity and Nehemiah is wise to allow all of the Jews into this task. And then uh, finally, after him the Tekoites repaired another section of the wall opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate the priests repaired each one opposite his own house. After them, Zadok the son of Emer repaired opposite his own house. And after him, Shemaiah the son of Shekaniah, the keeper of the east gate repaired. So you have city officials 
And one other interesting thing that, that he did is he aligns where possible interest groups. The men of Tekoa all work together. The men of Jericho work together. The goldsmiths work together. The priests work together. Families work together. And so wherever you could, you would get communities of interest. You would take the unified groups and, and put them into the work. And then they're all unified as fellow Jews. Not everybody, I know this is going to come as a real shock to all of you, not everybody in your place of business has high-minded commitment and passion for what you do. Some people are there for a paycheck, right? And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Well, the same is true here. So the best thing to appeal to, and this is what Nehemiah starts as he said, there's a vision here. We are God's people. God's hand is in this. Let's come together and put aside our differences and go be about God's business. That's great. And when that didn't work, he appealed to self-interest. The way houses were done in those days is if you were gonna build a house uh, and you had the walls of the city there, you would build your house like the wall of the city would be one of the walls of your house. So it was really a smart move. A, you're really secure. You got great insulation because those walls are really wide, right? And so literally you would build your wall or your house right off the wall. So when they're talking about they were building the wall opposite their house, what he meant was, we'll take this section which is in my backyard. Guess what? I really want that part of the wall to stand up really well, right? If people attack, I don't want them getting through into my backyard. And so while you do as a leader appeal to people's sense of purpose and vision, there are times when you also just have to take people where they are and you appeal to their self-interest. And I think it's just interesting as you go through this list, if you've ever read uh, in your Bible reading plan, you've read Nehemiah chapter three, admit it, you skipped ahead, like, yeah, 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 who is this guy and what's he building? But I wanted you to mine this a little bit and realize there's some really interesting lessons here of how Nehemiah applied some good leadership lessons. So when all else fails, self-interest will motivate some people uh, to get to do what needs to be done. Okay, so now I want to show you some pieces. This is today. This is, in fact, if you go to Israel, we're going to walk right there. This is going to be us. We are thin uh, in Israel. We're stick figures. And we're going to talk about this little house, which is a fascinating little house right there from the time of David. This wall, by the way, I know it looks kind of bad, and that's because it's 3,000 years old, so give them a break. You know, it's just, it's weathered pretty well. This is from the time of David. But you see inside this box, you see that tower? That is a piece of the wall of Nehemiah. So there's a little bit of those sections of the wall. And I'm going to show you uh, somebody standing up here now so you can kind of get a better feel. Is that, is that helpful to you? That is not a trivial wall, is it? I can't tell you how tall it actually was. I can just tell you how tall it is today. And even so, that's not trivial. And so what they were doing was basically just piling up these stones that had all been pushed out and they were just rubble and they would stack the stones up. And it's not just one layer. Notice how thick this is. Many layers of stone. So this is a prodigious amount of work. This is a substantial wall that's designed to keep an army from being able to conquer Jerusalem. So let me pause for a question and we'll get, we want to summarize this into what's the third step of leadership. But before we do that, what questions do we have? How do they know the piece that's David's and the piece that's Hezekiah's? Uh, yeah, well, okay, first of all, the bricks don't have anything stamped in them. Like this is from the time of David. But basically it has to do with what you found in, that, in those layers and in that area. And they could be wrong. I mean, archeology span is kind of detective work a little bit. And so if, if you follow archeology, span you'll see a find and the archeologist will put forward a theory that this, uh, I mean, the city, I'll give you a great example. The city of Bethsaida. So it's in your New Testament and it's the city where a couple of the disciples are from. There are currently, two, three, 
four different places that they think that's the biblical city of Bethsaida. And, and so the point is, there's no signs there. Bethsaida, population 500. You know, they don't find those signs. And so when you find it, you have to do some detective work. But over time, uh, let me just give you the short version. Over time, just kind of doing the detective work, what's found in other areas, and then ancient descriptions, is the thought is this is probably 10th century, this is probably 5th century. So around the time of Nehemiah. So that's a good question, and to be fair, all archaeology should be taken with a grain of salt, not because they don't do good work, it's just because it's not as simple as it seems. There's an awful lot of interesting little detective stories that happen with this. So, that's what they begin to build. And as we pause before next time, they're not going to have this completely built tonight. And so they're going to begin, and you notice they divide the work. That's a great leadership lesson. They cast a wide net that all the Jews that are committed to God's purpose can be part of this. You'll see in our next lesson, none of the people there were allowed to be part of it. This is God's work for God's people, and they are going to be the ones that do this work. And so you've got high-born people, low-born people. You've got the guilds, you've got the priests. You have anyone who has the common bond of being one of God's people and wants to engage in God's work can be part of this. Powerful lessons for the, for the international church today, by the way. I don't have to apply that lesson. I'm sure you're getting it, and that is there are things that we need to be doing in the world, and it needs to be a call to anyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ and who wants to be about God's business in the world then let's go after this problem. And we'll set aside for a moment that you think this about baptism and you think that about baptism. And you think this about the end times and you think that about the end times. There are non-negotiable things. There are things that make you a Christian and things that make you not a Christian. But for all the followers of Christ, let's get together and work on this. And that's kind of what they were doing here. Let's put aside our differences and our social differences and our occupational differences and let's come together. This is a great example of the kind of leadership that we could use in the church today. Question? You mentioned the sewer system down the middle of the road. Such as it was? Yes. Yes. From the north to the Dungate. Uh -huh. During this time, would it have been above ground or below ground? Uh, that is a really good question. At this time, it would have been above ground. So sewer systems, I didn't realize we were gonna get into sewer systems at this level, but that's really good. We have a civil engineer out here, but in, in all seriousness, this is, fa this is actually fascinating. So in this era, it's above ground, like it is in a lot of third world countries. I mean, seriously, it, you know, if you've ever been there or you've seen the pictures of just open street trenches kind of thing, that's the way the world was 2,400 years ago. That's a shame. That shouldn't be. But in any case, when you get a little bit later in history, one of the places we go in Israel is a Greco-Roman city from, oh, think 500 years later than this. They have an impressive sewer system. You walk down the street and you don't realize it, but there's sewers underneath, exactly the way we do it today. So... There were such things as sewer systems and civil engineering, if you will, not quite this early. So this would have been a little more rustic, a little more authentic country smells. <laughs> Any idea how many people were in Jerusalem at this time? Uh, good question. There were, a, a, let me go back and say, there were a lot of people in Jerusalem in 586 BC when the Babylonians destroyed it because they killed hundreds of thousands of Jews in, in that whole area. Now, not that many. If you go back in time, you can, you can see the records in the Old Testament of how many people came back in 538 and how many people came back in 450 and that kind of thing. I'm not saying that that's exhaustive, that that's all but you're looking at in the land at this time, I'm gonna guesstimate 100,000 Jews or so. I mean, it's not like a, a massive, massive number. Jerusalem was almost uninhabitable. I mean, it didn't have any functioning uh, systems at all. It's just been torn down. So people would come in, they rebuilt the temple, they would build some kind of a, a house if they could, 
and they would just do their best in living there. So it was, it was not a good situation. So when the wall was destroyed, mm -hmm. before they rebuilt it, how was it destroyed? Yeah, so how was the wall destroyed? So the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, remember him? Nebuchadnezzar comes rolling in, and you've got to understand the geopolitical situation. So let me just give you the really short version. I want you to know why they're so ticked off about this. So Nebuchadnezzar, he comes, uh, the, the Jews in Judea, in about 605 BC, they... Uh, are paying tons of taxes to Babylon. Babylon says, we're the new kids on the block, send me your taxes. And you say, you know, they said to them, are you gonna build us a new arena for the thunder? And he's like, we're not spending a dime here. You just give us the money, I'm building a palace over here in Iraq, right? That's the way it worked. So the people were very resentful of this. So needless to say, it impoverished them. And all joking aside, it, it impoverished them. So the king of Egypt said, man, I don't know about you guys, but we ought to band together and beat these guys and let's not pay them. I'll tell you what, I got a big army. I'll cut your taxes in half. Why don't you join me? And so many of the people in that area said, yeah, I think so. That sounds really good. And so they just quit sending checks, right? Nebuchadnezzar's accounting department says, oh, you guys are 90 days past due. Nebuchadnezzar, what do you want to do? He goes, oh my gosh, these people are rebelling. So he gets an army. Now remember how I told you how much, how long it takes to get here, months. So he gets a big old army together, marches them all the way down there, gets, destroys a few towns and says, hey, I'm here to collect the rent. And he gets to Judea and the king of Judea goes, did I forget to send that check? Oh, actually, you know what? I was thinking I'd pay more rent. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, you bet you will. And so he doesn't destroy him, and he marches his army all the way back. That's expensive. It's, it's infuriating. They do this about three times, right? 605, he shows up. 597, he shows up, uh, which is, by the way, when uh, Nehemiah's uh, family's probably taken. Daniel is taken back at this time. He says, I'm going to take some captives. You guys better pay. Well, anyway... He finally has had enough. And so in 586, he shows up and they go, oh, did I forget to send the check again? He goes, no more of that. He said, I am really mad and I'm gonna make an example of you guys. So this is a really long answer to your question, but I want you to know why would you go to this much trouble? Why don't you just kill a few people, burn the place down and say, let that be a lesson to you because he's ticked. You know, it's like, you guys have been doing this too much and I'm gonna send a message. And so he burns the city of Jerusalem, takes tons of people away. All, the only people left are really poor people and takes everybody back and says to his engineers, destroy this place completely. The Romans are gonna do this again, by the way, in 70 AD, and they're gonna do it for the exactly the same reason. And Nebuchadnezzar said, let this be a lesson. And so he puts it on the internet, right? He's like, you wanna see pictures of Jerusalem? Let that be a lesson to everybody else. Don't mess with the Babylonians. It's why the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. It's like, don't mess with Rome. Do you know how many battles that probably kept them from having to fight? You make an example of one group of people. So they literally bring the engineers in and they topple the temple. They get to the walls and they fire up their bulldozers and they literally push them over into the ravines that are on the outside. So they actually brought engineers in and slave labor. Guess who destroyed it? The Jews, of course. They just enslaved the people and said, you're gonna go destroy this place. So he was ticked. And so they literally dismantled it. So that's a really great question. How did they get in this shape? They got in this shape by some really bad administrations. I mean, let's just put it, let me just put it to you this way. Really bad international foreign policy by some Jewish kings for a while. People, foreign policy matters, okay? So that's how they got where they were. So what's the lesson of this section? Lesson number one, pray, commit your endeavor to God. He did it, we should do it. Number two, prepare, expect that God is on the move. God is active in the world today. And three, commit. 
You have to fundamentally as a leader, and then the people following you too, but you first have to commit wholeheartedly and answer this question, what are you willing to give? Think about Nehemiah. Nehemiah gave up his job, a safe, secure, good paying job. He traveled months to go to, I mean, there's not even a Motel 6 here. This is roughing it. He's going to risk his life. You just haven't seen that yet. That won't happen until the next chapter, is he could have easily been killed in this endeavor. He is all in to be about God's business, and he was willing to commit everything he had. Now, if you think about it, that's one of the reasons I love this story. And you think, well, this is an Old Testament story. What does it have to do with us? Do you realize that's exactly what Jesus did? He said, I'm going to go redeem God's people. And even though, I'm gonna quote Philippians 2, even though he was equal with God, he didn't consider that something to hold on to, but he emptied himself and humbled himself and became a human being and was obedient even to death on a cross. How committed to you was Jesus Christ? All in. What does Christ ask of us? He said, do you need to be a good person? Do you need to be a rich person? Do you need to be a nice person? No. What do you need to do? Trust Jesus Christ. Surrender your entire life. What's Jesus asking us? Are you committed? Are you all in? What are you willing to give to me? And the answer that Nehemiah gave, the answer that Jesus gave, and the answer that we give. And I realize not every leadership is giving your whole life to it, but every act of leadership and every good leader answers the question is what are you willing to give? How committed are you to this endeavor? And imagine that if it's your business endeavor, you will commit time and you will commit your talents and you'll commit your energy and you may go above and beyond. When it's God's business, you will commit your very life to it. So the essence of good leadership is commit your endeavors to God, expect God to move, and then answer the question in your own heart and pose that question to your followers, what are you willing to give? Well, in our next lesson, as we go into chapter four, things are going pretty well because they've built about half the wall. And unfortunately, all of their neighbors around there, all of the naysayers notice these people could actually be successful. We better do something to stop them because they're gonna shake up our world. And every leader knows that you should expect opposition. And next week, we're gonna see what kind of opposition did he overcome. Thank you guys, I'll see you next time.